this situation. Oh, okay. It's not that bad. I'm Yana. I'm Bo. And we are here to talk about episode 18 of Critical Role Campaign 1, Trial of the Take, part 1. Part 1, yeah. I think yeah. this is actually the one that we're going to be doing two parts of, like as opposed to the next one, which is going to be, you know, one whole thing, and, and we try to go through it as fast as possible. Yeah, for now the plan is to, uh, like, the first two episodes of this are joyful, fun adventures. The second two parts of this are no. And I think we're just going to, like, put the second part into one episode where we just run through the highlights, of which there are few. Is what's going on right now in the, the critical role world, I guess? I don't know. I've stopped watching. <laughs> I mean, uh... B- big things are happening in campaign three, but I'll let you know when you can watch it again, uh, if you want to. I mean, I mean, you know, I want one specific spoiler for what's probably going to happen in the f- upcoming episode. Um, and if that goes a certain way, I might watch again. If it doesn't, we'll see. I mean, I might. You might watch again if just if like the Dorolos show up, right? Depends. Yeah, I mean, like I'm gonna pretend that there's not a guy named Wolf there. Because I don't understand why we have that. Or a guy named Vax there. But, like, maybe we'll just meet Vesper. Oh. And maybe somebody can explain whether Vesper was always intended to be Nasima and they just didn't mention it when she actually appeared on, appeared canonically, or whether she just had white hair because whoever did the portrait didn't know Percy's hair was uh, due to trauma. Yeah. We don't know. We've talked about this in episode 7. Yeah, or maybe they just didn't care that it was from trauma. I think that's something I hear a lot from people is, like, I think people just don't really care and they just like the aesthetics of it and like yeah that's also what I think they also didn't care to remember that we that we had two canonic de Rolo children names that were just forgotten yeah and were objectively revised. better objectively better so much better so much better so like part of the reason I don't actually want to like I mean it would be cool to meet the cast but I don't but probably for a meet and greet and nothing beyond that yeah. because I probably would just start asking very accusatory questions <laughs> Yeah, me too. It's it's also why I'm hoping that if, if the, the, the roles do end up being in campaign three, it's only for like a brief cameo and not for like a whole episode. Just because I feel like the more we get to see like Vex and, and even Percy like played by uh, other people, like inevitably like there's just going to be like no one's ever going to do a, good, a job as well as good as Laura Bailey. I mean- Hi, uh, this is Ball from the Future. Um, spoiler alert for campaign three. But I was right, and I stand by it. I mean, this is hardcore campaign three spoilers. Is it? Just, you know that, like... Starting now. I'm not gonna say what's going on. No, no, no. No, 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 I want to say something specific. Go for it. Hardcore campaign three spoilers starting now. You've been warned. Do, 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 do. Technically, if they just stick to Keyleth, Marisha could just play her. I guess so, and I think that would actually be kind of really fun. It would be really fun. I mean, there's technically nothing preventing everybody else from just doubling up on roles. I mean, Laura has played Vex during this campaign several times now, just never on screen. Yes. But Marisha could just actually do that. Yeah, I feel like that's not what they're going to do, but like... No, probably not. It would be actually the, the genuinely the smartest thing to do, just because like nobody. It's I think this isn't just this is especially the case with Vex, but like it is the case I think also with like we have like Grog. Nobody does a Grog as good as Travis. Like yeah, yeah. I mean Ashley comes close. Ashley comes close. I mean Laura also comes close sometimes. She does. <laughs> nobody gets to like nobody does a Grog Grog that is like. Has like as much weird, like range. Nobody like everyone always goes really low, and nobody does any of like the the grog high notes. Yeah, because there's more to the grog voice than the deep gruffness. There's also the uh, cadence. Yeah, there's the cadence. Spoilers have stopped, I suppose. Yeah. Are we done with the spoilers? Yeah, we're done with the spoilers. <laughs> you can go come cool. back. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I think that at some point in this month, maybe later in this month, there's going to be an, an announcement of some kind about. Uh, season two of The Legend of Fox Machina, if you haven't watched the... Oh, um... God, right. Yeah, that is true. I recall that there was an announcement of an announcement the very day we posted our Legend of Vox Machina special. Yeah, and if you haven't watched that special, you should check it out. It's on our Patreon. And probably at this point, by the time this episode goes out, we would have already posted, like, part one. But if you want to watch the rest of it, or listen to the rest of it anyway, you can uh, check it out on our Patreon. Like... A surprising amount of people actually have. Yeah, 
M and o and not all of them, and like most of them actually paid us the money. <laughs> most of them did, yeah. So yeah, four out of five is a pretty good quota. Yeah, remember that we are on Patreon and you can support us. Look, look, look at me, Anna. Exactly, look, I'm doing a, I'm doing a thing. I'm so proud of you. Yeah, I'm um, doing it. This came up so organically too. So on the Patreon, you have access to the fully, um, full one part, three and a half hour long, um, taking club into town thing. Mm-hmm. On the YouTube, we were going to eventually post, maybe we already have by the time this is published, who knows, the entire thing in three parts with me telling you annoying fun facts in between. <laughs> so there's an incentive to actually pay us money for it, but yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Um, also on our Patreon, you can find the um, by now almost a year old uh, Vex and Supplementary Materials, which oh. I'm still kind of proud of. Yeah, it's still a really good episode. Yep. Yeah, I, I, and all the outtakes. I can't think of any other Critical Role announcement that is relevant to us right now, so do you want to just get into the content spoil warnings? We can. I was about to say, like, and you can also find the outtakes on our Patreon, where you can listen to Baal explaining insane moments in research history to me just five minutes ago or so, yeah. which I'm still not quite over, so if we're a little aghast and out of it for the rest of the episode, that's why. Yep. I mean, it's just amazing. Like, there is just... I'm not going to get into it because, oh my god, there wouldn't be enough content warnings in the world. But, oh my god, we've done some stuff. Yeah. We've done some stuff. I can't wait until um Jacob Geller and Everett Bleed does a video about it. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Every time like, I, get, I go on like a Wikipedia deep dive, like Jacob Geller does like a, a, a YouTube video about it. And I'm like, oh, I guess we're doing the same deep dive, huh, Jacob? Wonderful. Mm-hmm. Anyway... Content spoiler warnings? Sure. Hello, hello, hello there. Welcome to the content and spoiler warnings. Starting right off with the content warnings, uh, there is a little bit of gore in this episode. Um, it's a little more than usual, but it's not, you know, the goriest episode by far. Uh, there's some uncomfortable relationship dynamics, specifically with Lara and Aldor, which might be a little bit too much for some people. Uh, as is typical for Campaign 1, there's disrespectful language towards sex workers. And this episode does have some cruelty towards horses, uh, though I do believe the horses survived this episode. As for the spoiler warnings, we do end up talking quite a bit about Campaign 2 and Campaign 3 spoilers, in particular, like, a, a, an arc that comes a little bit, you know, past the midway point of Campaign 2, so if that's something you're worried about, keep that in mind. Uh, additionally, there is no Orion Akaba in this episode, and there won't be for at least this episode and the next. Uh, I believe he's here for about under 10 episodes, so enjoy that. That's all I have to say to you today, and uh, see you around next time. Bye! Out of Game Tippets! Yeah, so this episode, this Out of Game Tippets, this episode was first aired on July 30th of 2015, and we are recording this on October 2nd, 2022. Officially in the fall. Yeah! Yeah, for me, full starts in September, but yeah, okay. Um, did the outtakes for, like, the last time we recorded in early October ever make it? Because I remember having a tangent about Germany Day then. I don't remember. Probably not. We lost a lot of episodes that that time. And a lot of outtakes. A lot of All outtakes. the outtakes, actually. <laughs> yeah, a lot of content we promised. Well, I mean, long story short, uh, tomorrow is the day of German reunification, 22nd anniversary, anniversary, 20, 32nd anniversary of that. Germany has existed in its current borders for 32 years. <laughs> oh, Bank holiday. Oh, Germany, it's ex- Germany, as we know it, is a millennial. Yeah. Yeah, Germany is barely like... Germany is three years older than me. Yeah. Two years. Yeah, no, three years older than me. Yeah. Anyway, new background. Yes, yes, Matt is now sitting in front of, like, weirdly sterile-looking white tiles that kind of make this look like a hostage situation broadcast from someone's basement. Yeah, which makes the mysterious head kiss so funny. <laughs> yeah, true. And also these tiles are just so white 
They're like, this looks this looks like a prop that is only exists to be splattered with blood later. <laughs> Oh yeah, this is uh, only a prop made for like when when like Matt is mysteriously no longer there and there's just a a, a spatter of blood where he used to be. Yeah, <laughs> uh, he doesn't have the sconces yet. Those are coming, I think. Uh, I think they're coming for the second part of the trial of the tag, actually. And I love the sconces. Other things. Yes, and they've also added the neon sign to the set that was like I think teased in the previous episode. Mm-hmm. And Trinket. And Trinket, though we don't the actually see him. of Trinket. We do see him. We see him? When do we see him? He he hangs out in the background the entire episode. Oh, I didn't notice him. They they called attention to him in the, in the previous game. There's a shirt about his existence. I know, now. I know he's there, but like I couldn't see him in the, like, I didn't, like, my eye just glazed over him, I guess. My eyes, not my eye. He's just sitting on the top. Like, I mean, he is not sitting behind Laura, which is kind of weird. He's sitting behind the top table. I guess. Man, I didn't see him. That's weird. It is... Wow. I'm sorry. It's the, it's the truth. Trinket is there. Uh, it's the teddy bear version of him without armor so far. The armor comes later. Yes, he does. And the last we saw of him is I think he now uh, lives in Ronan's bedroom and Ronan probably lives in him. <laughs> Apparently, as we're told, this bear sucks you in. Uh, not in any... Yep. Not in any, uh, you know... Not in the way a horny teenager dolphin would do. <laughs> Shush. Uh... But apparently, every <laughs> just sits in, sits on top of the trinket doll. Just gets like engulfed by the two of the trinket doll. It just digests you. Bacon Sundry has lost several employees in this bear. It's actually very tragic. <laughs> it's like a gelatinous cube. There's just like bones floating in him. Yeah, but he's cuter, I say. But honestly, they are very cute gelatinous cubes. Yeah, I agree. They're, they're very cute by co- like just conceptually, they're very cute, but. And not just when they're played by Ginny D, but there's also like this actual canonical gelatinous cube called Blabagol that you kind of communicate and can take along on your journey in an adventure. <gasps> oh, I love that. I I don't know this. I know that my D. Dean... We had that in one of like my uh my dungeon master kind of appropriates from modules sometimes, and we had Blabagol with us for a while. I uh, you know that in in my D and D uh, campaign we have like a little house house bed slash cleaning staff that is a, a, a basically a, a tiny gelatinous cube that cleans up oh that is so convenient yep. it's like a, a soapy gelatinous cube i'm not quite sure what it's called but like it just cleans our bathroom and we call him schloopert 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 oh that that's amazing mm-hmm. everybody needs that i wish we'd invent that in real life just like a little friend a little yeah sentient gelatinous cube that cleans your so- your soap grime yeah and my favorite game about a magical school where you uh, put students into little houses and teach them magic. There is a creature called a drooler that just that you place in the school and then he crawls through the entire school, drools and cleans. Oh. It. The cleanliness rating goes up when you have a drooler just drooling around your school. What it's what cute. game is this? Is this? It's not three houses, is it? Um, no, 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 no. It's called Spellcaster Academy, I think. You kind of build a magical college in it and fight off the forces of evil and and make friends with local uh, with local creatures. Like my favorite part is the skeletons that want you to be friends with everyone. <laughs> um, and you also live on a turtle in the final level. And I never really finished the game because I but it um, but it does give you like you raise students, put them in houses, and then they get like cool cool futures and stuff. It's a really cool game. It sounds cool. And if you need something to to scratch the magical school itch and don't want to fun turfs while doing so, Spellcaster Academy. It's on Steam and like 20 bucks or something. That's a public service announcement. Uh, other out of game mm-hmm. tidbits, back to our, our actual job. Uh, <laughs> Sam is not late this time. Sam is technically late, but he arrives just at just when they put, put when they um uh, pay attention to the fact that he's late. Yeah, he, they like, said just perfectly. Like he'll, he's like, he'll arrive promptly, and then he just arrives. Like they, like he was waiting for them to summon mm-hmm. him. Pretty much, pretty much. They then uh, start introducing the guests, but the introductions may not proceed without the only time we will see Orion this entire episode. Is Orion the source of the mysterious head kiss? Yes. Oh, I didn't know that was Orion. I'm pretty sure it is. My my uh, attention to details, like visual details of this episode was uh, very limited, apparently. Fascinating. This can only build well. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so there's uh, Mary Elizabeth McLynn and Felicia Day are at the table. 
Yeah, uh, they do need to... Apparently, I think Mary Elizabeth McLennan shows up a little late, but she does also... No. No? No, they're just there when the episode starts. I guess so. Uh, and uh, we are told that this is going to be one of those episodes that's a snappy one, because Laura has to catch a flight. Not only does she have to catch a flight, but like she specifically delayed a flight... So that she can be here. Yeah. But now that that means that basically, like, the end, the episode when, will end when she has to leave. And it does. Mm-hmm. It does. Not a minute more. Mm-hmm. Laura Fish begins and ends episodes and breaks. This is her power. <laughs> Rule updates. Yes. This is, this is for me. This was done for me. It explains many things. Like, okay, first of all, um... They kind of announced that they have nerfed Percy and his shots, which, sure, fine. Yeah, that was that was always going to happen. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about this with uh, with uh, Lily at the time, I think. Mm-hmm. In episode 11, when we discussed combat mechanics and when Percy just kind of, like, dominated the entire Beholder battle. Yeah, she's still Lily. It's just that we talked about it with Lily in a Lily episode. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. And also something Lily and I have been wondering about... Um, also in private chats ever since then, we have finally get an explanation to what the fuck is going on with the sorcery points. Oh my god, yeah. Yeah. So the sorcery points. Apparently, the rule so far, which explains so much, is that um, Tiberius can do only one thing with his sorcery points. He only has quicken spell. You usually get, like, I think three or four meta magic ways at this level. Like, for example, he could have the thing where he spends a sorcery point to exclude... Um, to exclude the creature from the friendly fire of his attack or something, or uh, like a twin spell where you can cast when you can target more than one person. Yeah, or twin spell a, seems um, to be incredibly useful, by the way. Yeah, there's also like a thing that lets you double the range of a spell. But of course, it is it is true that the first thing you're going to take as a sorcerer and the one that makes the most sense is quicken spell. Now we find out here that the way they've been handling this is just that you spend. As many um, points as spell levels as you have spell levels for that, and then you can just cast a second spell, whatever, um, with your with with your sorcery points, which explains why he keeps ca- calling out um, exorbitant amount of spells of of sorcery points that he should not have. But I mean, I also think he has like twice the amount of a lot of sorcery points. But hey, mm-hmm. whenever he does this, so he only he, so he calls out the. Um, the number of points for the spells for the spell level, and then can cast two spells with spell slots a turn. They have nerfed this because they realized that maybe maybe the game wasn't balanced for a full caster to be able to cast two fifth level spells in a round. Maybe not. And no, it maybe wasn't. Not. So now they have limited the um, quicken spell to a second le- to up to a second level spell, which I'm personally like. I think this is fine. I think this is great. Um, because the rules as written tell you that you can only do this with a cantrip, so you can still only spend one spell slot spell per round. You can just mm-hmm. make one of those cantrips a bonus action instead of an action, or you can have the spell as a bonus action and the cantrip as an action. I think you can actually like do this and maybe like start introducing first level spells at level 10, second level spells at level 15 to be cast with quicken spell, and then third level spells at level 20 mm-hmm. to just make more... To just make the power scaling better towards the end, but that's yeah, just agree. me, and I just like playing hard hitting, uh, hard hitting spellcasters. So, anyways, we now have the ground rules um, for how sorcery points are supposed to work here. We can now observe them um, accurately for the future episodes, which, of course, we will absolutely, totally, completely enjoy doing. Yep, we all we're gonna love doing this. Yeah, this has been my rule report. Thank you for your rule report, y'all. Anytime. I think. Are there any other other game tidbits we want to know? We can we can mention the gimmick from the break here. Oh right, yeah. It's a it's a nice thing. It's a yeah. So like mm-hmm. you first. So this is a, mostly like a a, a can another you know, cancer research goal essentially. It's a cream pie challenge. Like yeah, it's a cream um, pie challenge. This was the thing about going like, around. Cream for cancer, cancer cream. I don't know that what they used for it, yeah. but like it, it sounded awful. <laughs> yeah, there's a video of the cast doing this and just hitting each other in the in the, in the face with cream pies, or like I mm-hmm. think um, somebody threw it at. I think um, Sam threw it at Talison and it just stuck to Talison's face on the side or something. It was 
funny and then Marisha <laughs> just very um um I don't have the English word, but she kind of very much enjoys slowly smearing the plate into Matt's face. It's a great video. They don't show this in this episode. In this episode, they show, like, critters doing the cream pie challenge and nominating each other. other. Mm -hmm. Which is nice. I think it's a, it's a good choice. It is getting a little bit into the, the territory of, like, oh, this is probably someone's fetish. But, like, some, you know, it's nice. It's literally called a cream pie, I mean. Yeah, yeah. And it's yeah. nice. There's, by the way, a German critter in the um, in the compilation, and I caught that just the second they started speaking. <laughs> the accent and or was the, the pattern? Kind, not even the, like, okay, kind of the accent, kind of the choice of words, kind of the background, and then um, <laughs> after they... Uh, the background. After they, uh, after they splashed themselves with the, with the cream, they just said scheiße, which was like, oh yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I clocked them, I clocked them, as German on double speed, by the way. I have a gift. <laughs> you do. I do not. This is not a gift. I literally grew up surrounded by people speaking English with German accents. Some strong with some less strong. Anyway. Anyway, we have an actual thing to talk about here. Yes, we do. We're so recording for so an hour. Are... We haven't talked about the episode yet. <laughs> Where are we at, Yada? Vasselheim. We are still in Vasselheim, the city of a thousand uh, killjoys. <laughs> After kids, losing, yeah. yeah, we lost Pike in the last episode, not through death. She's just, you know, she just went to do her religious duty. Uh, she got a job. Got, she got a day job. <laughs> we got grog humiliated, and now we just generally don't have any idea what we're supposed to do. Uh, the party well, they didn't. Then they well, they didn't. They stumbled Dick first into the first thing they could find that was attacking the city. And due to some weird legal technicalities that uh, should not be enforceable in a court of law, they now have to join a cult to avoid being being prosecuted for killing the thing say, that was attacking the city. And you might say that they're not a cult. They're just an organization. They're a cult. They're a cult. They're Don't. a cult. They have They're weird rules cult. that outsiders don't understand, and they have a goddess they worship whose prophet is in their basement. They are a cult. They get tattoos. Uh, oh god, right, that too. They have they like a motto that optional. rhymes. They have weird induction rituals. They have They're hazing. loved by a power couple? Yeah. Speaking of said power though, couple, mm -hmm. they were then split up by said power couple into two teams. Mm -hmm. Uh those teams being the super happy fun times team and the perpetual misery team. Um, I'm very proud of those names, by the way. Yes, perpetual misery team does sound like the kind of name you'd come up with, like if you're on a like a, a field day at a Catholic high school. <laughs> Which kind of fits into the entire uh, aesthetic here. Yes, and today we have the endless pleasure of joining Team Super Happy Fun Times on their hazing ritual. Yes. Yes. All right. So we start off with the twins being mopey. Yep, they are sitting in a tavern, just about ready to go. Matt is a horrible Vax. He's weirdly, he's a good Vax, but not in the way that he's playing Vax well. And like, he's often like much more tolerable, but he's not Vax. Yeah, he doesn't really depict him well. This is like here he is lit little. Okay, in this Matt plays a very catty, bitchy Vax. You know. Yeah, which I don't just like, but that it, it's not catty or it's not quite catty in the right way. Yeah, yeah, it's too confrontational. Think, yes, yes, the actual Vex would just make like a self-deprecating comment and then look sad that that Vex would be mean to him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this, but this is like a short and um, inoffensive. There's going to be a scene in I think episode twenty-three that Liam actually took issue with because actual Vex wouldn't care that Vex shows off her tits. <laughs> yes. That's true. I agree with that. Yeah. Like, Vax, Vax does not care. Uh, yep. For all his faults, he doesn't care about this. Nope. Vax can share her titties off to whoever she wants. Mm hmm. Talison is really fucking on this episode, just from the get go. He puts his feet on the table just in, to honor Liam if he were there. Yes. In fact, like, Talison. Sorry, I, I got confused about there. Uh, Talison is. Like really stepping up this episode in terms of just like this episode, 
the things that I really like about the Trial of the Take episodes for all they're worth is that they, they really make the people who are, uh, who like tend to kind of drift to the background really step up for the first time. And that, that like characterization tends to stick. Mm-hmm. So you get a lot more like Grog actually like showing up and, and having like these interesting character moments. Or you have like Percy being just the funniest bitch in the world. <laughs> Funny and bitchy. Funny, bitchy, funny, bitchy. I yep. love him so much. And, like, that yep. sticks. And, like, this is just an episode where Talisman just gets to shine from the moment, like, from, like, minute one. He's just amazing. Yes, um, and this he uh, takes the time they have before having to meet for their, uh, for the hazing ritual to make a, to make a holy hand grenade. But only after yeah, first she shows him that she has breakfast for him on the road. Yes. Uh, which I could make, like, an innuendo about, but why would I? <laughs> Not quite yet. Not quite yet. But um, he manages to say the the phrase "I'll have a granola bar" and make it sound <laughs> like the poshest, bitchiest thing ever. I love him so much. There's another posh, bitchy thing that comes up pretty soon afterwards, but I'll get to that mm. when that happens. Uh, but yeah, he. <laughs> I really like this part because like, um, Talison at first says like, "Oh, I don't have time or the materials to make like something," and then like he kind of like backs on. I was like, "Actually, if we have like a couple minutes, like at breakfast, I'll make like a, I'll make a little hand grenade." And it's just so like, <laughs> well, maybe just a little little inventing <laughs> is a treat for me. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, Sam puts a lightning bolt into the Iune Stone. Uh, I disagree with this choice, but well, I also disagree with this choice. It's not really like a thing. Like I would also put like more. Emergency spells into that, not damage doing spells. Yeah, especially with their team composition. Like, admittedly, they don't know who they're going to get with them. But for now, um, hi, Scamlin. Not sure if you know, but you're the only healer so far. Like, maybe Vex has a has lay on hands now, but it's like it's technically all up to you. Something that Sam is apparently not as good with as we thought he would be. Hmm. I wonder if that's ever going to come up. But everybody remember Jester was the bad healer. Everyone remember Jester was the bad cleric. Anyway, so uh, Percy can't have a breakfast, or can't have a full breakfast anyway. Not yet. He gets an inspiration song, and he's starting to run out of black powder. I really like the inspiration song. What's the inspiration song again? Remind Boom, me. Boom, clap the sound of your gun. Oh! There's actually a couple really fun episodes, fun yeah, Sam songs in this yeah, one. Sam had really good songs this episode. Yeah, there's uh, one later that's um, oh yeah, that, that doesn't work for like, uh, no, I don't wanna be hurt by you. Dun, that one's dun, really good. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> mm-hmm. That one's fun. That one doesn't work, but it's so fun. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. We get the black powder uh, foreshadowing. Yep, we're going to see the very, very fun Black Powder merchant soon. It's always a delight when Percy runs out of Black Powder. Yep, and then they go back to Merton, who's like, wow, you're only 25 minutes late. Which, good for them. Refuse to be hazed on their terms. Yes, absolutely. Also, I I still really like this guy. I think Merton is really fun. Oh, yeah. He's uh, he's a little groggy. He's got some papaya on his face. (laughs) Well, which we... Preemptively established that papaya is a thing that they have in Vasselheim. Apparently, Apparently. I better the the trial of the like the the Slayer's take have like uh, some sort of fruit, like a uh, really, really good fruit merchant. I mean, we see the um, farmland section of the town that is act that is very much fueled by divine magic later on, so they could probably grow papayas there. It's a divine papaya. Yep, a holy papaya to match the holy hand grenade. He's a little groggy when they come in, which grog immediately. Yeah. Yeah. And we get our uh, our first guest coming in. After grog wishes him court strength, I wanted to be I want to be a bitch about this and take note every single time grog yeah. and or Keyleth pursue their god arcs that were wrongfully and rudely denied them. Denied, utterly denied. Mm-hmm. Also, it is a little bit funny that nobody remarks upon S- Scanlan's Ion Stone in these halls, but hey. Yeah, I guess it's whatever. Maybe they just think it's a weird rock that floats around his head for, like, decorative I mean, purposes. we're very early. We are so early. We're going to, like, talk about this soon enough that, like, this is early enough that world building doesn't necessarily stick. 
Yeah, I guess you're right about that. It's just we'll a get thing. there. Anyway, we'll get there. We're just being bitchy. Anyway, Zara, Zara's here. Zara, everybody loves Zara. Vex doesn't. <laughs> Vex doesn't, but you'll love Zara soon enough. Uh, yeah, this entrance scene is so amazing. She just yeah. comes in there with this all this self-important importantness and gravitas, and it's just like I don't know you. I don't know you. She knows Philip. Well, Grok, the Philip, the Grok, the Philip, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and just um, <sighs> makes, a got... point to, makes it a point to mention that she almost hits, I think, Vex with her horns. Yeah, and, and can I say, tail and, mm-hmm. Mary Elizabeth McGlynn has said at the start of this episode that this is her first time playing Dungeons and Dragons. And, like, uh, you she would know. <laughs> she has it so, like, she is in. Like, she comes in fully in character. She has, like, this strut coming in. Like, it is, like, the confidence is so felt. Like, it is amazing to me that this is our first time playing D&D. <laughs> she comes in there with a clear mission statement of pissing everybody off and mm-hmm. proceeds to make everyone love her. Yeah, she's it's here to make mix everybody now. annoyed and kind of horny. <laughs> Yes, and she succeeds. She succeeds. I mean, she also then just hits on, like, she shuts down Scanlan when he hits on her, mm-hmm. but she hits on Grog and on Percy. Weirdly kind of hits on Percy, too. She definitely hits on Grog. Grog blushes, and we now know the, that he blushes blue. Yes. And immediately and Percy just... does my favorite yep. little posh boy thing where he tries to sniff out if she has any blood. It's not not blue blood necessarily, but does she have blood? And he's so excited that there might be another noble in the room. Oh, thank God! Somebody who's just as posh and bitchy as he is. Yes, and you just and during this entire conversation, you just see Laura with the biggest stink eye whenever mm-hmm. Zara says anything. It's amazing. Yeah, which I do think is like very in character for Vex, especially since like with Vex's, you know, yeah, problems with wealth and and. You know, the yeah, Zara fanciness. comes in and exudes like elegance and silent judgment and like, yeah, yeah, that's kind oh. of what happens. Yep, this is this is reminding mm-hmm. her of stuff. But yep. yeah, it's yep. you, we really this do get like a sense later on. I think that like this, uh, with the knowledge of who Zara is, feels to me like in retrospect, kind of like introvert bitchiness. You know, like when you're entering like a new group, like you know how I get sometimes like when when pe- like I met I meet new people and I get like very like hostile towards them because it's like. I don't. I don't know you, new person. Mm. <laughs> yes, new person. Mm, I don't like the smell of them. Mm, I'm too good for them. Couldn't be me. I mean, a new person. I need to be liked immediately, <laughs> so badly. Otherwise, I get. I have failed and get a bad grade of being a person. Oh, but yes, this is sort of how it appeals. Uh, this is like upon interpretation, it does seem to me like Zara is being a bitch in part because like mm, her defenses are up. Yeah, she's just a bit, a bit standoffish. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, he doesn't quite get like pretty doesn't quite get a read on if she's uh she's blue blooded or not. But And neither do we ever. It's kind of unclear. It's kind of unclear. There's some implications, but none of them are ever, you know, defined. Yep. And, and then I've done something. Uh-huh. I've been meaning to do like an entire time actually, because this is as much a review of Critical Role itself as it is like just recounting atmosphere, fandom stuff. We weren't in the fandom at the time that it aired, so whatever. But mm-hmm. I actually ventured down to the comment section for this. Ooh. Which you should see because... Yeah, I see it. This is from six years ago, so this is uh, actually like yeah, probably this is around fresh. the time. This is fresh. This, this is, is like fresh. in response. Yeah, so I have um, in the notes that you can access when you pay us $2 a month on the Patreon, Um, I have... I've like posted a screenshot from a comment made by Phoenix Mar One six mm-hmm. years ago. It was, I think, the top voted comment of the entire thread. Um, because in comes Felicia Day introducing the newest playable class, Camp Counselor. <laughs> I will admit that I, I found myself a lot more endeared by Lara than I expected, but um. There are aspects comes... about her that have that I don't really enjoy much, uh, yeah. which I think comes down to a certain sense of humor. Um, yeah, cringe well, comedy isn't my thing either. It's cringe comedy and the kind of raunchy aspects of the character are like, mm-hmm. yeah, those aren't those don't work for me either. 
But, like, the fact yeah. that she's, like, also, like, the most moral person in the group and is, like, insistent oh, yeah. upon it. Like, I was like, oh, this actually, yeah, she's right. Why are we, why are we booing her? She's correct. Yeah, and she's just a bundle of nerves and anxiety and I kind of relate. Yeah. In a way. Yeah, no, I agree. I also kind of relate to, to the whole Lyra aesthetic and also behavior. Um, I found her to be kind of tragic, but before we get to that, and she yeah. comes... Spilling Papaya, the volunteer, established member of the Slayer's Take, quote-unquote, Lyra. Yeah, she just falls in, spills papaya everywhere that we now have established exists, and on her best robe. <laughs> her, an- her her energy is extremely anime. So anime, she's running in with so the, the, the toast in her mouth. She even manages to lose the robe during this interaction when she tries to pat the papaya off the robe. Yes. I mean, at least it wasn't like the tissue exploding fabric anime kind of anime, so hey. Yeah, the the spray of, of like, the jet spray of, of uh, blood from the nose kind of anime. Yeah, but more like the anime where you get punched and then your clothes explode off of you. Yep, those kinds of animes. Sex mm-hmm. comedies. Mm-hmm. Not particularly yeah, intelligent not sex comedies either. Not that. Um... When she comes in there, she is like, she has like the camp counselor energy is real. Yep, she wants to know what everybody wants for lunch. Like, does anyone have any allergies? Like, so that she can get lunch for everyone. Does it, in the, I think Travis says cats. Which, yes. No, of course, Travis says cats. He just immediately answers cats, which uh, I know, but also as, in regards to lunch. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's funny and also it's extremely Travis, since we know that Travis is very allergic to cats. Yeah. So am I, by the way. Yes, I know this. It's one of the reasons mm-hmm. why I haven't tried to court the, the local cat more strongly. Oh. Uh, the local cat that gets beat up by other local cats? Yeah. <laughs> anyway. The elder the elder stuff. The elder stuff I found like to be the most obnoxious part of the character. Yeah, yeah, I like in places, it's a very much, um, oh, this stuff is funny when it's uh, the woman who's a stalker one. Yeah. Also, like, I don't know how I feel about, like, the story she has about Elder sleeping with her, with her when he's drunk, because it does seem like he initiated it. Yeah, uh, it does seem like he initiated it and took the armor from her and then has never hasn't spoke to her since, but is still wearing her armor. It kind of feels like he took advantage, but then you get to the part where she tells him that Originally, she he was hired to protect her, so she kind of was his employer, and it's it's, it's uncomfortable. It's just uncomfortable. You don't like it. Yeah. It's, it feels gross on so many levels. Both I will say I do enjoy the running gag of her talking about this and Scanlan being like listening intently, and then everybody in the background is just like, "Oh my god, end me now!" Yes, I also enjoy the fact that like. This starts up pretty early. Like they ask her like how she got into the Slayer's take, and like she never gets through the whole story. <laughs> No, no. From all we know, like um, she uh, she defeated a warg, which is a causes a cute bit of confusion. Where like, oh, do you mean like the thing where you enter the minds of animals, which is a warg, which is a uh, Game of Thrones, Song of Ice and Fire kind of thing that some people there do, but we're yeah. actually at the warg stage, which um. I wrote into the notes that the that works are actually like the mounts from the orcs in Lord of the Rings before Matt said it on the episode, and I didn't remember him saying that, but I was correct. So you yeah. geeks, you're both geeks. <sighs> yeah, it's adorable. Anyway, uh, I, what else is adorable is that both the the whole like Game of Thrones thing happens. Like Laura says, like oh, it's like uh, someone who like shapeshifts into animals, and then like. Uh, uh, Mary Elizabeth McGlynn corrects her. He's like, no, 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 it's not somebody who shapeshifts into the bodies of animals. It's somebody who, like, you know, puts their minds into the bodies of animals. And, like, <laughs> Matt has to <laughs> be like, okay, it is if you're reading a certain <clears throat> fantasy series. <laughs> <clears throat> you don't know shit about Game of Thrones. <laughs> yeah, but it's so cute that they Evidently. both, like, get bashful about it afterwards and, like, that they try to correct <laughs> each other on this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Then they enter like Vanessa and and get on with the um. Okay, now before that, there's the little there's the fun bit of physical com- comedy where like um Percy has his granola bar or like a very crumbly biscuit for breakfast and Talos yes. is just seen eating this in the background and then at some point like uh 
Grog asks everyone what their weapon of choice is, and then Lyra, Lyra whips out her wand. Um, yeah. And tells him to just dodges that one while still eating. <laughs> <laughs> tells him it's really on fire. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. So then Vanessa comes in, and before even giving them the contract, they're getting, like, get, they get, like, gifts. They get gifts, quote unquote potions. gifts. This is very much like the kind of gifts that you would get from a workplace. Like it's the kind of like, oh, this is a gift, but also like it's on it's company policy, and like you don't get it scratched up, and like this comes back to us afterwards. I don't think the other group gets as many healing potions, which um, yeah, for good reason. But for good reason, this is intended. Like it, like actually, like when she's before she gives them the contract, like um, oh god, her, I'm blanking on her name. Vanessa? Vanessa, yes. Vanessa basically tells him, like, just so you know, like, you don't have to die doing this. <laughs> like, it's better to, if you come back alive from this, which I think is, like, the nicest that she's ever been to anyone. And also really... It's in better to live and fail than to be foolish and die. Like, we can... We're going to talk about this in a, in a second, but, um, yeah. It's very much her, like, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, this is not... In, you're not supposed to succeed on this one. Yes. This is a setup. This is hazing and also a setup because somebody really wants to get rid of Lyra. Yep. Yep. Which is and also kind of mean too because now that I think about it of course. Like if they intended this group to be to fail they intended one of the twins to be in the group. Uh, yeah. So they in, like they knowingly like not only did they divide the, the twins into separate groups they were like intent fully intending to like only acquire one of them and for the other one to not be in the Slayer's take, which is um, rude. And also, why would I you mean, take Vax? <laughs> uh-huh. He's not even a hunter. We will be asking ourselves this question many a time, but I think, um, I think actually, there's a in the contract they read out, there's a stipulation that on the mercy of the hunt mistress, you can actually join the Slayer's take regardless. So I mm-hmm. think if the like this was kind of to suss out whether the um, remaining members of Vox Machina are smart enough to. Well, either good enough to do this or smart enough to leave. They wanted to get rid of Lyra. Zara is collateral damage, but it, but there was this clause in there that would probably have allowed them to um yeah, to enter I, these people in into the into the Slayer's take regardless. Yeah, that's probably what Matt would have done, just because like it would have been very mean to like only have some members of the, the permanent party be yeah. teammates or not. You'll be wondering why why uh, an organization would have Vax as the twin to join them over Vex many a time over the mm. con- over the uh, entire course of this campaign, and not only with the Slayer's take. No, this is not even the most egregious one. No, believe it or not, this happens multiple times. There will be rants. There, there will, will be, be rants. so many rants. She also very much underestimated, like how stupid this party, like, this specific group is. <laughs> this party is a very specific combination of stupid and strong. Yes, very strong, very skilled, oddly fragile except for Grog, and no healing ability. Four of hummingbirds. And yep. one brain cell, which is Vex. Sometimes it's Percy, usually it's Vex. Sometimes Vex allows Percy to have the brain cell. Yeah, this time is very much Vex. I don't think Percy has the brain yes. cell. Yes, they also, like, something I completely forgot is that the bag of colding that uh, Vex is going to have for the rest of the campaign is actually a loner. Yeah, don't, don't loan stuff out to Vox Machina. <laughs> don't loan yep, stuff nope. out to Vox Machina. They're <laughs> never giving it back to you. Nope. Nope. That one is just staying with her permanently. And then uh, mm-hmm. Vex and Zara um, play Boulder Parchment Shears over the bag of colding before that was named. They don't call it that, though. They call it Rochambeau. They do. Uh, I mean, they also they... mention Antioch and a bunch of other real-life stuff in this, which is weird, but hey, whatever. Yeah, they're new to d d It's fine. Um, yeah. Zara, uh, Mary knows what the Glen is, anyway. Uh, Zara, uh, like, Vex wins. Um, she does. She then gets she spanked is... by Zara. Yes. Who didn't mean to hit her upon a rear end with a tail quite so quite so strongly. Mm-hmm. It just has a mind of its own sometimes. Yes, it does. She does definitely have like a mean dumb vibe in this episode. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so oh. sorry that this hurt you so badly. Mm-hmm. Oh, I didn't mean to hurt you quite this badly. Mm-hmm. And they've established a pecking order, which is 
you know, the usual Becky Walker and Peely. It's Vex at the head and, uh, Lyra, Vex you know, on top. Vex on top and Lyra getting, you know, told that she's, no, she's doing a great job. She's doing a wonderful job leading. Mm-hmm. Don't, don't worry about it too much, sweetheart. Yeah. yeah. Usually it's Vex making a decision and then Lyra being like, I agree with that decision. Let's go with that decision. But- Literally everyone but Lyra makes decisions this episode, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah everyone but Lyra makes decisions, but also I want it noted that, like, Vex is... Vex makes Vex. the most decisions. Yes. Vex makes Vex the most decisions, decisions and the hardest. But then they finally, they, they, they are given the contract after being given potions, which are divided evenly, except for, I think, Vex well, and Well, I'm pretty sure takes them all. Yeah, that's right. That, or at least he says he takes them all. I'm not actually sure if he takes them all. We'll find out next yeah. episode. Yeah, there's this thing where everybody's like, well, no, I have healing potions, but if you feel like you need them, <laughs> then Scandal's like, yeah, I'll take all of them. Take all of them. Which is not a bad idea, because he is... <laughs> oh, yeah, he's buddy. down, everyone's down. Yep. And they are then given the actual contract, which is really cleverly done by Matt. Mm-hmm. I assume he's the one who, who wrote this. It's really, really well done, because like the first... You know, three fourths of it is just like legal jargon, so it kind of like makes sort of. Like, it, mm-hmm. Well, it's not it's not fully legal jargon, but it's like it's it's non like it's this filler basically. It's just like blah 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 blah. Do this, do that, do this. This is important. Don't do that. Um, and like by definition, it's it's kind of wordy, so it makes like the party kind of rush Percy as he's reading it. So there's like blah yeah. blah blah yada yada yada. He also has the perfect accent to read this out in. Yes. I'm so glad that he gets to be the one who reads it aloud. So, it, by the t- so like it, it leads to this perfect like your quarry is one adult white dragon, what adult white dragon? Yeah, his double take is perfect. Perfect. And I, I, it, the yeah. the way that it's written leads up to it so perfectly. Mm-hmm. Like yeah, they it's very mention, good. like it says in the at the top that the, the um, mentioned below, mentioned below, mentioned below, and then it's just. Um, I'm pretty sure in an actual legal document you would insert it at the top and then refer to the above. Yeah. It's what we learn in law school. You never refer to below, you always refer to above. You always go with the top. You do what the top says. Sure. That, yes. Mm-hmm. And um, this contract has a, has a stipulation I mentioned that um, if you fail it only by um, mercy of the hunt mistress you can join the take. Mm-hmm. I find it interesting that um, I find many of things about this contract interesting, which are all due to my chosen profession. Uh, okay, Go ahead so, and tell um, us. Mm, so, do you think this is a contract that was written up by the take, and then whoever wants to contract them just signs their name on top and their quarry at the bottom? I think so. Yes. I mean, this, this is very much a fill-in contract, yes, but it is also a contract that is that has been written specifically for like the joining. It is about joining the Slayer's Take. So I wonder if they have like special forms just hanging hanging around for these hazing missions, which is very <laughs> much what it seems like to what it seems like it is. But also, do like clients get to pay get to um, pay less when they get, when you when you give them like a hazing team? Because if you if I am the Temple of Erathus. And I'm like, I need these components from a white dragon. I kind of would rather contract experienced hunters for this and not an unproven hazing party. Yeah, you're gonna get like some dragon eyes that are that are like a little bit like not cut quite the right the the, the correct way. Um, I mean, this is a dragon. The chances of people surviving this like not like they are set up to fail. Yeah, and so this is like, is the temple of Erathus in on this that is this is supposed to fail do they pay a reduced rate what do they get out of it yeah i guess they probably do get like a reduced rate and maybe like they do these in bulk like maybe these are like we just need these components well, you know in bulk as much as you can for dragon parts but like maybe these are like <laughs> you know like these are, are things that they need not for a specific you know what i mean like almost like study materials like i mean there's only so many eyes and hearts you can take off of a dragon that's true but maybe like these are just sort of like yearly things. Like this is not a rush order, so it's like, well, if it doesn't, you know, if if like this mission like fails, then it just rolls over to the next one. Yeah, but it's also weird. It's very that weird. they have that they have um for something that is so hard to take down as a dragon, they have um they have this uh, short of a time frame to do it. Oh yeah, like, like three like, days. This barely works out. 
the way it's written feels very much like this is meant to fail. Like, they're given, like, like, the other party, I think, is also given three days, um, possibly more, but... Uh, yeah, their mission is I mean, in Vasselheim. With the other party, the question is how does the person contracting them know that there's a Rakshasa secretly conducting business in Vasselheim? It's a good question. This is leads like, to even on more a, questions. Yeah, like on a on a Watsonian level, if I were somebody who actually wanted to order dragon parts, I don't wouldn't like be like, and if you don't manage to do this in three days, the contract is null and void because um. I really need those dragon parts, and that's a big quarry, but it takes a lot of effort. So if they get, if I get it a week later, it's like, and like, and this, and my uh, business can't handle that. I manage the business wrongly. Like, I feel like this would be the kind of thing where you would be more um, gracious with the time frame, and also more gracious with like, I, I say like this is, you know, this is a temple thing. Like they're they're getting this for the temple of Arathus, which helps as opposed to like a company. So I guess like maybe they don't need to like operate at like a. They can afford to operate at a loss. Like, they need this for, like, potions and shit, or, or weapons and stuff, mm. rather than needing it for, like, uh, selling. Yeah, yeah, I think my point is that I don't think this contract is real. Like, oh, you even think this was, like, the... not even commissioned by anyone? Yeah, no, the Crown of Arathus was just, like, oh, semi-official in, the, in here, because if you actually wanted those components, three days is a stupid time frame. It's a really giving this to time frame. giving this to rookies is stupid. This is not how you would conduct business like that. It's just just all of this is a setup. None of this makes sense, which I think is on purpose. And also might be a temple of Arathus thing to do. A kind of yeah, it, it doesn't seem like an Arathus thing to do. Like who is like about pros about what progress in civilization, and you think they would be better at drafting contracts? That makes sense. That's true. Yeah, yeah, I guess you're you're probably right. Like, I, I didn't think about it that way, but now that you're saying it, it does make sense. For this, this to be, like, like, fully just fake. This is mm-hmm. fake. This is this is fakey fake. All of this is fake, yes. They, somebody is... just really wanted to get rid of Lyra or prove her, prove her right. Like, I think next episode is going to be that uh, Vanessa's actually well pleased with Lyra passing this. Yeah, which, uh, which also makes sense to me, because it seems like... Um... Her uncle's not very fond of her. I think her uncle's not very fond of the kind of um, misadventures she gets up to, up to, which I understand. Yeah, but he doesn't even seem to like li- like. He, it's one of those things where, like, I, I, if I had to speculate based on the brief interactions, I will say that her uncle seems like he loves her. He does not seem like he likes her, which is a really shitty yeah. place to be with a parent or like somebody who raised you anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, anyway, speaking of her uncle, so. I think this contract is set up in a way that has the most amount of possible points of failure. Yeah, it's too short. You can it's time weird. Out, you can die. It's um, it's it's also yeah. interesting that like the uh the the other contract seems to have been made by someone who knows that hey, there's a um a rakshasa in sit in the city, whereas this one is much more like I don't know, Just find dragon. a white dragon. This the dragon. Yeah, I mean, this is also part of it, that you have to actually have to find a white dragon. I mean, I think whoever made up this contract does know the guy they end up talking to who talks about the white dragon, so there's, like, a possibility. Mm-hmm. But not not particularly strong possibility. Yeah. I uh, get horses. Anyway, they, they get horses, they sign the contract. I wanted to know that they sign the contract because Trinket gets to sign the contract and it's very cute. Yes. Yes. Trinket has to put his paw on the contract too. This is very cute. None of this is legally binding, but because <laughs> it is made under duress. Contracts you enter into to avoid criminal prosecution are not binding. Uh, in contracts the court of law. signed by an animal are not legally binding. We could argue whether Trinket has the mental capacity to sign a, sign a binding contract. I think he has like the same intelligence scores. Well, he's not quite the same as Grog, but he's, he's barely below, below Grog. Grog. Mm-hmm. He is barely below Grog. God. I st- I, yeah, I still don't think it would be legally binding. It's a bear. I don't... It's, he's he a bear. He can hold a conversation. He's a bear. He can hold a conversation. When he's in speak, uh, speak with animals. Yeah, that means he... But he doesn't have the... He probably also doesn't have the anatomy to make human sounds. Of course. But also, Much like, like a dolphin. You you have no way of knowing. Like, you know how, like, speak with plants gives some plants the ability to speak, even though plant they don't have the intelligence to speak? 
Uh, but Trinket seems to be capable of higher thought. I he is capable he could... of higher thought. I do agree with that. And Have he's... you debated this before? No, I do agree with you that like he is smarter than the average bear. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we've had this conversation before, but and I say now I, I do really, think really want to develop like a legal code for D and D stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and I do think Trinket is like on the spectrum of like being uh, Vex's pet to being her son. He's closer to her son. <laughs> So he could be limitedly legally capable. Yeah. Much like a small child. Yeah, he's like a child. God, if I ever run a D&D round again, I will bother people so much with the legal specificities. <laughs> well, that sounds actually like a lot of fun. Uh, anyway, we spent too long about this. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. You put the lawyer on the contract. <laughs> no, I think I, I, I should not have started talking about drinking it. Um, anyway, uh... They get horses. When they get horses, they are... Later. They get into a... Oh, sorry. What? Uh, the? We are still in the guild hall. Okay. Guild hall. Sort of. We The work, work thing we've um, mentioned earlier. Now we come to the to one of Percy's best quotes just ever, which happens after Grog manages to grow some a bit of facial hair. <laughs> yes, and I've spoken about this, so... Uh... And, now he, and now he looks, quote-unquote... Like a 14-year-old whose father didn't love him enough to teach him how to groom himself. No parental issues here. None whatsoever. Nope. This is uh, I one have of my favorite Percy quotes. This? You do! I do. I think that, like, I, well, I don't want to, uh, like, mitigate Percy's daddy issues. Yes. I do think it's worth remembering that he is a middle child. <laughs> He's a third of seven, yes. And that, that may have colored his experiences somewhat. He is a second son. He sure is a second son. He has younger brothers who I, who might have... Hmm. I'm not saying that it's not possible that he had, like, legitimate gripes with his father. I'm sure he had legitimate gripes with his father. I'm just saying that, like, I think like that... Like everyone does. Like everyone does. I just think that I don't think his dad was, like, abusive or anything in that regard. I think he was just normal. No. Yeah. It's just... The normal kind of neglectfulness that a father has of sometimes that I you can't definitely critique. That a father but... has with six other children, uh, all of which like, are louder than you. Dad, teach me to shave. And it's like, uh, uh, give me ten seconds, Percy. Not right now. There are three babies on me right now. Can you just ask like one of our servants to do it? <laughs> and I'm not saying that's not with all of Percy for, be- take- for be- having a grudge. It's just... <laughs> Don't take it too seriously, is my point. <laughs> uh, Percy's yeah. a very unreliable narrator. He is. Anyway, so now they fan out and um, and look for information, which mm-hmm. they end up in like a tavern in the Melora district of Vasselheim, which is like the magical divine greenhouse where they may or may not be growing papayas, but they also have a tavern where there is one local character called Dagon after Matt's bird. Uh, oh, Marisha's not here. Which, yeah, they're just sad. He who has seen a white dragon on the road at some point and is really into telling the story. He seems like a really nice guy. I like him. Yeah, he seems fun. And I, I like the dynamic of everybody being like, oh, here he goes again. And then he tells a story. He is very practiced at telling the story. Yeah, he has like the vibe. Like, not, Matt says this that he that he this feels like a very practiced story, but he does not need to say so. You can tell that it's a very practiced story. He like nails all the plot beats, and like you can just imagine his friends like mouthing along to oh, and now here comes yep. the part with the the dire wolves. Here they come. Here they come. <laughs> and they nearly bait him into a conversation about the differences between wargs and dire wolves. <laughs> Which is an interesting conversation to have, just not when you're on a time crunch. Yes, now when you have three days to do this. Yep. So from him, they find out that there is a white dragon, th- two days a horse to the northwest of here on like a glass something way walk road. Glass, glass, glass way, glass something, Glasgow road. Yep. That one. Follow the glass road. Yep. They no one here likes a dragon. <laughs> Which is one hell of a thing to say in a city that is one fifth devoted to a dragon, but hey. Mm-hmm. So very, a very much beliked dragon. 
I would say. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> So they they kind of they try to uh, convince him to like be there. Um, this is something that happens a couple of times. But they're like, "Hey, do you want to be our guide?" And he's like, N "No, fuck no, no, I don't know. I don't want to no get eaten thing. by a dragon. What is wrong with you?" Mm -hmm. I'm not going yeah. back there. I also really like how I think it was Max who rolled inside on the dude to see if he's serious, and Matt is like, "He's not the most complicated man." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's a himbo. Leave him alone. Oh god, and then Vex has one of her sexiest moments in the entire campaign. Oh, which one is that? Oh, it's the, the she, prince. Um, when she kind of does the anime lean over uh, Lyra and then fondles her coin purse and is like, maybe put that away. Oh yeah, it's very sexy now that you mention it because like, she specifically puts, sexy. puts her hands on her shoulders and then like fondles yep. the coin, coin purse and it's very much, it's it's very dommy. It's got very femdom energy. Yep. It's yep. sexy. I also, it is, but I also enjoy how they all kind of decide, oh my god, we have to adopt this child now. <laughs> And just this, try this to, useful uh, adventure. Yeah, and just try to uh, kind of prepare Lyra for the real world mm -hmm. occasionally. Yes. You don't want to walk around with a limp. You don't want a, a coin purse that's so heavy that you walk around with a limp. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then procure horses for everyone, which um, Zara uses a suggestion to do, which Matt lets her do without rolling for, rolling for like sleight of hand, I think. Yeah, no, he just makes he just uh like makes a roll for the the, the spell itself. I actually uh, he rolls a, a check to see if the our saving throw, I guess, to see if he succeeds. The guy fails. She's no sleight of hand. Uh, I guess yeah. this would be like Arcana in Vasselheim and like very shady Arcana in Vasselheim, but I don't think they do it outside. I think they do it indoors. Yeah, yeah, and then Lyra kind of chews her out over it. Would she like? She's right. She's, She's right. right. Is the thing. She's right. She is right, and it is true. Like, um, getting horses rented out to you on a dangerous trip without like a deposit or anything—that is, this, that is—they are ripping off this poor man. Yep, they are. And like, it is definitely exploitative because there is a very, very low, very, very low chance of those horses coming back alive. Yeah, I think this time they actually do succeed in bringing them back alive, but like. Like, it's not... Mark's yeah, because Machina Matt, doesn't want to, Matt doesn't want to scare the newcomers. Yes, and, like, Vox Machina is not known for their um, their excellent horsemanship. No. Specifically in this one, like, Raw gets, like, a, a big war horse that is, um, oh, just so struggling. <laughs> this poor war horse. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. Do this we have to horse. put animal cruelty into the content warnings? Maybe... By the end, mm. Matt basically says, like, like, this horse is going to be sway back by the time you're done with this horse. Like, oh. Oh. Uh, Matting it. Mm -hmm. Cruelty against horses. <laughs> Poor horse. But yeah, I agree that uh. this is exploitative and, and Lyra is correct for scolding her. It's just that, like, she's more yes. scolding her for doing it without permission. Because she wants to look cool. That yeah. is Lyra trying to look like she's totally down with being morally ambiguous, but ask her first. Yeah, she's a she's and she would never say yes. Is the thing? Yeah, <laughs> like if you asked her, she would say, "Don't do that." <laughs> yeah, it is a bad idea for several reasons. But mm -hmm. um, again, Matt is going easy on the newcomers. Yes, he which is. might have given uh, Mary Elizabeth the wrong sense of security of how much is safe to fuck with salespeople. Mm hmm. Just putting that out there for the future for when we return to this very place in like five years or so. <laughs> uh, and it's also <laughs> something that's gonna. I don't, I'm thinking again about the, the dragon arrow situation. That's a situation that Matt had more control over. <laughs> yeah, it does though feel like in a, in a kind of cosmic way her comeuppance. <laughs> Maybe. Mm hmm. Uh, in Maybe. the same way that, you know how later in this episode, Percy goes, like, one day, many, many years from now, I will get you for this. <laughs> this is how that feels to me. Uh, so off yeah. they go on the road. Horse well, actually, before they go off the road, they go to see uh, Lyra's uncle. Yeah. 
They get cloaks. Who also, they get cloaks. He's also a very like, wow, they're letting you outside. Yeah, at first it looks like he's um he's like just shutting the door on them, and then like if he comes back and gives them a bunch of stuff, and is like, take care, don't like don't get killed, and seems genuinely fond of Lyra, but like, uh, I've said my vibes, yeah. I, I I my vibes are very much just like he seems like a fine parent who loves her a great deal, but like um might not like her very much. Yeah, which is very sad. Yeah, just the, at the very least doesn't like what she's doing with That's, her life. That's- Poor girl needs more actual friends. Yeah, more people who like her. She just needs to be liked by someone. She needs mm-hmm. to find, like, a goody two-shoes party that's just full of clerics and paladins. And she just, yeah. you know, just fit in with them. Like, you don't need to change who you are for the party. Just find your goody two-shoes party. And, I don't know, save orphans from fires. There's a table for you. Yeah. And then they kind of leave and uh, throughout the um, city... A city that has no paved roads, but apparently they may- inside the city, but apparently they maintain a mean road outside <laughs> of the city, which is easy to follow, which- Priorities! That feels very pointed to me, of just like, there's a paved road leading into the city, but not in the city feels very much like, oh, we like it this way. Like, they were offered, <laughs> and it was like, no! Outside is- I don't think the road outside is paved, but it is apparently very well maintained. It's a cobblestone road. Uh, but yeah, it's not a dirt path, is what it's not. Apparently so. And then we just kind of, they, they, uh, ride their horses along the way for a bit. Mm Mm-hmm. And then they make camp, because it is dark, and night, and the day is over. Yep, uh, Vex makes her first, like, oh, is there a dragon nearby check, and uh, does not get a ping. Her, uh, the range on that is, uh, three miles, so there is no dragon within three miles. Six miles. Six miles. There's no dragon within six miles. Yeah. And then they, uh, they just, you know, they take first shifts. There's a, there's a cute bit where Grog tries very meticulously to get a fire going, and then Vex comes over and does it for him. Yeah, he warmed it up for her. Mm-hmm. He's so huffy about it. He, he got it, you know? He's, he's, he would have gotten it eventually. Yeah, he got it. He mm-hmm. can do this. So you, you helped yeah, her then... so much, buddy. Mm-hmm. You're participating. Mm-hmm. He's contributing. <laughs> He's helping. Uh, and then they take first trips, which are first trips for, for a second, I thought the first trips were going to, going to be Percy and Vex. Uh, but that, no, that was a misunderstanding. Uh, which, you know, uh, makes more sense. Yeah, the characters sense. misunderstand, like, like, Mary Elizabeth thinks that, uh, Zara is holding first watch with Percy, which is also a misunderstanding. Mm-hmm. Instead, we get, um, Zara and Vex bonding? <laughs> They kind of accidentally bond. In spite of themselves, yes. Yeah, they start off very hostile. They're just, like, very prickly about, like, oh, you and, and stuff, and, like, where did you come from, huh? I actually love how Vex starts this off by just being like, so where are you from? <laughs> and just immediately, because <laughs> Vex is the nosiest bitch. She is. And she means this with full offense. Yep. She just wants to know, like, hey, if where's you seem like a fancy bitch, or which um, which fancy fancy town that you crawl out of? And the fancy fancy town is actually a cage. It's actually a cage that her dad kept her in. Yes, and this is where I was. Um, I did my apparently um, traditional research binge mm-hmm. for all of these episodes now, because uh, Zara says she's from the faraway land of Farron. Farron. Now you. Darling, sweetheart, duck of my life, tell me, where is Farron? What is Farron? I thought that, I mean, like, this is a very Watsonian reasoning. I think the, the more on, like, the, honestly, that it was probably just a place that got scrapped or, like, somewhere in the in Wild Map. But I honestly thought in this episode while watching this that Zara was lying and she was just making up, like, a city name. That is actually possible because, I'm, like, the wiki says Farron is the place where Zara is from. It's far away and in the mountains. The name is not mentioned in the campaign guides. It is not on any map. It is never mentioned at before or after. Like when uh, Lilith shows up and is like her cousin from a similar place, she names a different place that is also on no map and a no campaign guide. And I think from like vibes, the tieflingness, um, and everything, we can sort of infer that it's probably somewhere in Jorhas. Oh, that does make sense, yeah. But we don't know. It's uh, never been mentioned again. It might be a real place in Jorhas. It might be fake. It's probably a place in Jorhas, but it's, um, I don't know. Maybe it'll come up in Campaign 3. We never know. Things come up in Campaign 3 that are just very interesting. 
And I was like, oh, I never thought that was ever going to come up again. Huh. That was something else I thought, that, like, uh, Zara with all of her moon stuff could be really interesting for Campaign 3. She could, because her, her moon stuff is the... Well, I mean, like, this also is very telling, because she talks about the moon singular. True. Yeah. Moon singular. Who's all, with, like, her patron is apparently called Sirius. I could make jokes which, about this. Of course. Which the wiki um, theorizes could be related to, like, a servant of a Sehanin. Oh. Um, is it the Arkhart? The, the elven goddess that would be a perfect, would have been a perfect fit for Vex with the secret trice. The one, <laughs> the one that shows up in campaign <laughs> two at one point. Yes. That everyone ignored. Mm-hmm. She put, she went to, she put, uh, Garmi, she put Artagan in a horny jail. Yeah, and then, and then the goddess of sort of tricks, but also secret trice was moved into releasing him by Jester declaring her love for him. And nobody ever mentioned that again. Nobody ever Excuse mentioned that again. Me? Once again, I say this. If you are in a relationship with Jester, you have to be okay with sometimes the, sometimes Artegan is going to fuck you. And it's going to happen. It's like, always you might... reason, and usually you're the third wheel. Yeah, you're going to say, like, no, it's not going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen consensually. And you're like, no, it's not going to... It's going to happen. You're going to have to be okay with this. Campaign two and three spoilers everywhere. <laughs> yeah. I just think that if you... Like, Ford has definitely had sex with Artagan at some point, and it's uh, been a surprise for him, too. <laughs> and it's not the worst thing Ford has done with his dick. <laughs> Anyway, bold of you to think his dick was involved. <laughs> True. <laughs> okay. Bold of me to think his dick was involved either way. <laughs> Good point. Uh, anyway, back to this campaign. They end up, yeah. <laughs> Zara and Vex end up accidentally <laughs> bonding when they talk about, like, Vex mention has, like, a really nice thing where she talks about, like, oh, um... My mother was killed actually by a dragon. I wonder if it was a white one. It wasn't, but yeah, it was nice. Yeah, I think it's the it's like and keep note of this people who are because we are dragon claw them into this again because I think this is the only time before it's actually revealed that Vex actually mentions to anyone in this campaign that her mother was killed by a dragon, right? I think so. I can't remember her like oh, oh, I mean oh. like I guess like the conversation technically happens in front of people, but they also so it's a no, very vague think... conversation, and also, like... The people are supposed to be asleep. Yeah, it, it technically happens in front of people, but, like, in the way that conversations happen in D&D in front of people, but, like, really, they're happening in private. Yeah. Like that one conversation that I think Vax and Pike have, and then uh, Scanlan walks in wearing no pants. <laughs> well, another conversation that Pike and Scanlan have, and then Akita is just juggling. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Things that are technically happening in public, but not really. But yeah, I agree with you. This is basically the only time that we have, like, in canon knowledge that Vex says this to another person. Yes. Yes. So she's mm-hmm. like, yeah, my mom's dead. My dad was a dick. And then Zara's like, yeah, mine too. He kept me in a cage. And then Vex is like, getting good personal right here around the fire. <laughs> mm-hmm. And Zara's like, I'm sorry. I thought we were bonding. And, and they, they were just, bonding. They were bonding. <laughs> There's just awkward silence. Yep. And then, uh, yep. Yeah. That's, um, that's, that's their watch. That's their watch. Then Percy has a watch, and then he wakes up Grog, who calls for his mom, which is the only, literally the only canonical mention of Grog having a mother that we have. Yeah, it's amazing. That's the only one. He had one. We, we know that. And even that much is only gleamed from this aside comment. We little yeah. we know literally nothing else about we her. We don't even know if Grog knows that he has a mom. It could just be like a weird repressed memory that's making him like shout that. Yep. Yeah. Then it's Grog's Grog's watch time, and then he uh, hears some orcs and finds some orcs. Calls out for playtime. Everybody wakes up. It's kind of <laughs> groggy, and then it's a break. Yeah, I like to think that Grog has a mom, but it's like, you know that, like, wire mom, soft mom experiment? Yes. I like to you think have explained Grog... explained it to me and used my mother as an example. <laughs> yeah, I like to think Grog had the wire mom. <laughs> I like to think everyone in his tribe had the wire mom, the wire mom was an ex and nobody was using. <laughs> yeah, it's everyone that had the same mom, it's the wire mom. 
It's Axe Mom. Everyone go hug Axe Mom and tell her you love her. In return, she will say nothing. <laughs> you can make a religion out of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are returning from break. Both us two here and uh, on the show and we are right into the initiative with the orcs where only grog um, is aware of them everybody else is like still asleep and only grog and percy roll a decent initiative everyone else is in the single digits which you, you don't need to worry about though because grog and percy proceed to wow oh my god but yeah, they're, yeah. they're fighting, uh, well, I think it's one direwolf, right? One direwolf, a couple dire of orcs, wolf, and... There's a direwolf, an ogrelon, and several orcs. Yeah, yep. so most of them are like... The, the main thing is like the weird ogre, ogre orc. The ogrelon. Yes. Those are called ogrelons, and their monster manual entrants are interesting because they exist whenever an ogre mates with a human, hobgoblin, or orc, every other humanoid gets eaten. Huh. Which, uh, I mean, it's a, I guess it's a, a, a type of monster fucking. Yes, yes, they also say that the human mothers usually don't survive. Oh. The birth of one of these children. The monster Thanks. manual has some really dark stuff in it, if you care to look. Anyways. Thanks. Anyway, this is, um... This is why, according to my DM, abortion is a cantrip. Uh. Ha! <laughs> Good. Or anyway, contraceptives are a cantrip, anyway. That also. Mm hmm. Pretty sure they established this canonically for critical role in, in the, uh, in the, in some talks shows as well. Yeah. Uh, anyway. So. Off they go. There's a strand of hair out of place on Talison's mohawk. It's very becoming on him, I agree. <laughs> It was distracting, okay? And over the no, course I of agree. the second half, it starts curling. Like, he gets he gets kind of disheveled, which when you have this little hair it left, works it's kind for of an him. accomplishment. Yeah, it, it, it does. And Percy, the more like... Not Percy, Talison is uh, very... The, the dis- disheval looks good on him. Uh, mm-hmm. Grog attacks the dire wolves, all the orcs attack Percy. Yep. <laughs> and for this first round, he has an AC of 18. Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. For his first move, he would like to cry a little bit. <laughs> yes. And then he marshals his strength and proceeds to do some slaughtering. Yeah. Yeah, Percy is on also mechanically this time. He has, like, he rolls, like, three natural 20s in two rounds or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he um, kills the Ogrelon in one move. <laughs> Not in one move, but in one round. Yeah, he shoots it first the foot out from under him. Um... Then Matt breaks the rules and says reasonably that a flying target on the ground is actually gets advantage to hit for, with ranged attacks. Usually it's disadvantage because, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. I feel I like guess this like, is, it, should be very dependent on the uh, situation. I agree, because like, I could see it if you're, like, sni- if you're like sniping someone, them lying on the ground is a harder target. But like if it's an ogre one right in front of you. <laughs> yeah, usually when the target stops moving and lies down, it becomes easier to hit, but hey... Yeah, but like if you're, I guess, I, I think that this also matters more if you're fighting with like a bow and arrow. It's just, you know, yeah. makes it more complicated. Not, 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 the, not really the case with, um, with a gun. So then Percy, um, takes a decent chunk with his two actions and then he's like, fuck it, action search. And with that action search and a natural, uh, with an ex- action search and three hits total, he takes out the Ogrelon. And then has a net twenty on the next or- and on the next orc he hits. Yeah, and he regains a crit every time he uh, he regains a crit point every time he kills someone, crits, right? Yes, crits. Uh, killed someone and crits. Okay, so this is I a think. it's a good round for him. It's a very good round, according to Vex, it's his best night ever, which for now sure. And then we establish he's wearing the pajamas with the butt flap, and the butt flap is down. Has he established before that he's wearing pajamas with the butt f- flap? Because he he mentions it as though he's established it before. Not on stream, I don't think. Yeah, but he definitely says, I'm wearing the pajamas with the butt flap. Which to me says that he um, often wears these. Yeah, they probably made this like it make a, made a joke about this before the stream at some point. Mm-hmm. Like, what kind of pajamas would this posh boy be, boy be wearing? Obviously, a union, a union suit. Yep. The butt flap is down, which Matt then says, good to know, that will affect your armor class. Uh-huh. And, you know, uh, Grog swings his axe in a circle, hits three times, uh, 
And then it's everybody else's turn. Yeah, then all the orcs go because all the other characters have single digit initiative. Somebody coins me okay no, Telos was like Percy's cackling like a manic pixie and somebody then says manic pix pixie gunslinger. <laughs> Which is really what he is. Mm -hmm. Scanlan uh, tries cutting words with the uh, song Baal sang earlier, and it's mm -hmm. a pretty good song, but it reduces like two points of damage from 24 to 22 points. Mm. Yeah. It's not, not very successful. Next comes to Percy's aid. With Trinket. Shoots one arrow and then has Trinket, yeah, and she has Trinket attack twice. Which, of course, takes a while. Yeah, she's kind of panicky when she does this because she has to, like, look at her notes and figure it out because she never hits with Trinket. But, like, he lands two pretty good hits and kills someone, so yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah, he jumps up off a head and then yeah. has a snack. Yep, to which I think Travis says, do you want to cuddle with that? And uh, Laura immediately confirms it. Yes, yes, he does. Hell yeah, I do. Which I yep. always want to say, like, she cuddles with you, so... <laughs> True. And yeah, then it's Zara's turn, and she and like, it's it's Mary Elizabeth pointing at the board and is like, "Is that an orc right behind me? That's Vex," which is out of character, but still still really funny. It's very funny. Um, yeah, I think she has yeah. like either either she's not used to seeing a map or or um uh she can't really see it very well from her angle. Both would be valid, but yeah, it's very funny. <laughs> And then she uh she does uh, some fun warlock stuff. Yeah, she uh gets a lot of eldritch blasts, which are agonizing blasts, and also like a hex, and mm -hmm. um, does a whole lot of damage. And then like Travis stares at her like, "Holy crap, what are you?" Which um, foreshadowing. Unfortunately, not the fun. Like you won't have this much fun, but um, you know, you can hope. Maybe yeah. one day, buddy. You can hope. Yeah. But then Lyra gets a turn and, and uses Chain Lightning and causes 45 points of damage to two orcs. That's very good. Killing one. Oh yeah, in the meantime, Scanlan has dominated one, but it doesn't really matter because they kill it before it has a turn. Yeah. <laughs> he actually dominates it with the, the, um, the command to protect Grog at all costs. So, <laughs> George, yeah. Percy shoots him in the head, killing him, and yells, I'll, I'll, like, I'm coming, Grog! <laughs> Which uh, sounds dirty, but it's very funny. Boo. Thank you. Boo. Yeah, then with another natural 20, Percy kills the last orc, Grog finishes up, and then they have one, no, not the second to last orc, we have one orc left that Grog then intimidates into talking to them. Um, yeah. Lara speaks orc. Um, There's a very funny thing where, like, <laughs> I think in retrospect probably Matt meant for the orc to say, I don't understand you, but he Matt basically speaks in Orcish and says like wah, wah, or something like that, uh, and then Zara says like, "Oh, I speak Orcish," um, and then Matt says it again, and it's like a whole sentence with like like you know, oh yeah, and you're like, oh, did he say that? There's a lot of information in those two grunt noises. Yep. So either those two grunt noises meant I can't understand you, or Orcish language is very efficient. Either or. Either or. And then, like, Lyra tries to roll an inside check on the orc and rolls, like, a six. So Matt is like, he looks constipated? Yeah. <laughs> so it gets her very concerned about his diet. Yeah. It's a very fun way to explain that you don't know shit about this orc. Mm -hmm. There's an offhand comment about Lyra trying to cast friends on Aldor. Would you say okay. that she uh, she's not getting shit from him? What? Would you say that she's not getting shit from this orc? Huh? <sighs> ah? ah? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> and then the orc gives them the information, yes, there's a dragon, but also you'd be really fucking stupid to go and try and kill it. Mm-hmm. They try to get the rope the orc into leading them, but, uh... Once again, <laughs> they just really want somebody to lead them and nobody's gonna do it. <laughs> Yeah. Well, eventually someone's gonna do it, but it's coming up next episode. And even those guys don't really lead them, do uh, do they? Nope. Yeah. So then, like, um, when they can't really decide, okay, is the orc coming with us? He doesn't want to. What do we do with him now? Uh, Grok chops his head off, which Lyra disagrees with, which, and so do we. Yeah, like, they promised this guy they were gonna release him, or they said they yep. might release him. Like, the implication was that they were gonna release him, and, like, in general, it's just like, oh, this is, um... This is not good morally. 
This is not cool. Oh well. And then they like in the background Sam is struggling to get in to get any kind of sound out of a flute again. Which is still very funny to me. Like this I don't know very much about flutes, but I know that they're um famously hard to get noise out of. You just need to know what you're doing, actually. Like again, it's like with the with like a glass bottle. Yeah. You, you just blowing them as hard as you can is not gonna do anything. It's not a whistle. Nope. We have to, you have to hit an angle with a steady mm-hmm. stream of air. Yes. And the horses live. The horses live, yes. They are a little bit spooked, but Zara can talk to them and calm them down and promise them protection and stuff, which um, I wouldn't believe if I were a horse, but what do I know? Yeah. If a very sexy woman said so, I guess, sure. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> but this is also a very interesting thing. To like Zara talking to animals happens twice. Uh, one is when oh, she... Yeah gets the teeth out of a dire wolf and is like, thank you for your contribution, to which I internally said, like, but the orcs are not going to say anything to <laughs> Yeah, that was, that was, I mean, she didn't harvest anything from the orcs, so, you know. Mm. <laughs> That's true, I should be happy she didn't harvest anything from the orcs, but still, it just made me laugh. Like, just, she's like, oh, thank you, and I'm sorry, like, is very thankful for this wolf she very, killed. And it's like it's very cannibalism adjacent. <laughs> Cannibalism adjacent, yes, you're correct. Uh-huh. And is getting things out of the orcs. But yeah, it's it was funny. It was a funny situation to think of her doing that and then they all go to sleep surrounded by the corpses of the orcs. Yeah. Yeah. Which like has to smell, right? Has to smell quite bad, God, yeah. God, I couldn't I could not sleep in this situation, but hey, that's why I'm not an adventurer. I you would be surprised, but it's, I think it's very much dependent on like being I've heard a case of somebody who like slid <laughs> into, like, an ice crevasse and had to, like, slowly inch his way out and he uh, fell asleep inside there before he made his way out. And I guess, like, the lesson from that is, like, people will just sort of, when you really need to sleep, your body will just be like, listen, we're Um, gonna take a nap. But falling asleep is something you do when you freeze to death. That's true. It's a good point. It's, like, something your body has been shutting down. So, um... Yeah. Different situation. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of cold. Yeah, they then, um, next day they move on, move into the direction of the big mountain with a, with a scary dragon on top. We get the, Mm -hmm. we get parts of the story with Lyra and Aldor, which, um, we've read. We don't like any part of them. Yeah. Which we mentioned earlier and, uh, they did apparently have intercourse. Which is the least sexy way to talk about this, according to Scandal and Grog. It's not me. It also, like, admittedly, it's not a very sexy encounter. It seems very dubious. Yeah. And both both fronts seems very dubious. Yeah. Yeah. And I really like the moment of camaraderie between Grog and Zara when they when he when Grog is like, "I kill you, you kill me," and she's like, "Yes." <laughs> Yeah, that part's great. Uh, there's also a part earlier in the in the, the episode where um, Vex says like we're probably like I wonder if one of us is gonna die. I wonder if uh, if anyone's gonna die. And uh, Grog says I hope it's me. <laughs> yeah, they also asked Vanessa what happens when they don't return with all members they start out they um, set out with. And then Vanessa's mm-hmm. like, yeah, well, I guess that not all of you are going to join the Slayer Stake, but at that point, it's out of our hands. Which wonderful. <laughs> Once again, they they do have a lot of gripes, but this uh, this very much is the super happy fun time party, so it all feels to be like very and very much in like good faith. I mean, the mood is very light. Everybody has fun with this. They like they act out mm-hmm. the annoyance as a bit. This is yeah, fun. Not, they're not genuinely annoyed. Yeah, it's not literally the mood is not so bad that literally you would believe that everybody at the table wants to kill everybody else. <laughs> That's what we're going to get next. Yeah. Get to the episode after next one. Yeah, there's also a part unrelated, only slightly. I'm just remembering this because of the mention of the other party, where the Vex is like, "Why do we give the flying carpet to the other group? They yeah. have fly." Yeah, because the viewers can cast fly. There's one point where Zara is like, "Oh, we can. I can cast fly on us, and then we can fly, fly up the mountain, and then I can cast invisibility." And it's like, "Sweet summer child." Concentration is going to ruin all of your plans and also flying in a snowstorm. Yeah. Yeah. But I do like your enthusiasm. Yes. Yes. Yeah, this is probably the only time where Lyra takes a leaderly decision. She's like, oh no, flying. Oh no. Uh oh. Mm mm. 
Bad nope, idea. Nope. nope. Yeah. Um, there's also, like, uh, something that I found very mean from Matt is that they have to roll con- constitution saving throws against the cold and then take points of fatigue, which is um, a really mean yeah. thing to do to a party that's about to fight a dragon. And a very mean for, like, a party that's uh, mostly the weak sauce people. <laughs> that too. The low constitution people. That too. Um, um, Scanlan would have taken a point of fatigue, but... Uh, Lyra gives him her stone, her like stone of protection yeah, from cold. Yeah, I did really like this. This was cute. Yes, yes, it did have very much the vibes of because it's when she tells the story about Aldor. I have like German in the notes here. Um, the fatigue goes away from macht ihr Gedanken, which is something you tell a child that is complaining about the cold because you don't take the needs of a child seriously. Of like, think warm thoughts to warm up. Oh, ah, great. Yeah. Uh, what did my grandmother like to say? Uh, what I was told when I was in high school um, was whenever the classroom was cold, my teacher would tell me to go stand in the corner uh, because the corner is 90 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> okay, first of all, Americans mm-hmm. with their stupid temperatures. Second of all, <laughs> how is it cold in Arizona? Third of all, Wow. No, have you never been in a high school classroom that's getting, like, blasted with an AC? Just like... No! You're just, like, blasted to high no. heaven, and I you're freezing and falling asleep. I've never been in a high school with AC before. We suffer the 90 <laughs> degrees in the summer. We legitimately get the 90 <laughs> degrees in the summer. We have, like, maybe blinds if, they, if we can get them to work. <laughs> AC in a high school? Are we made of well, money? Well, we need... We need to have AC in high schools in Arizona yes, because we'll die. You live in we'll the, die. You live in the desert. We, we would uh, die, I think. Um, yes. Yeah, that is something. It happens sometimes. You get like an overblasted classroom in like midwinter, which midwinter in Phoenix is not that cold. But <laughs> but it's cold enough to be uncomfortable. And when you bitch about it, your teachers tell you to go stand in the corner. Anyway, there. this does lead to actually... Like a, I, I thought that the... Um, the exchange between Lyra and Scalum was kind of cute. It's kind of yeah. my favorite part about, like, Vox Machina is that Vox Machina is, like, the party that cares the least about who has... I mean, after after Tiberius leaves. But uh, who cares the least about who has which equipment? <laughs> like, they bitch about it, and they'll, like, have little arguments and spats about, like, oh, who has this this artifact, and who has the boots, and who has this. But in general, like, they tend to, like, swap around equipment very readily. yeah. Yeah, they are basically commune. Yeah, just like take. take oh, you, you need pants? You need pants? Here, I have pants. You can wear my <laughs> pants. <laughs> yeah. Then there's like a very cinematic appearance of the dragon with like a sleet storm, and they have to hide. And Grog takes a little bit of bludgeoning damage from the from the ice that falls. And then approach. And as they approach the mountain, Vex gets hit with a rock. As they approach the mountain, Vex gets hit with a rock because there's. Because the one singular white dragon isn't enough of a threat. We also have to have some giants here. Because every time Mad wants to delay from a yeah. threat, there's giants in the mountain. I thought this was very funny. The visual of it is very funny. Is just Vex sitting on top of the horse and trying to stare through the fleet sleet and then just a rock is <laughs> It's It's very cartoonish yeah. to think about. It is. It is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but now Laura has to leave for her con, so this is where we leave the episode. Yeah. There's one very cute thing when Laura says goodbye to everyone and Talison says bye, dear. Oh. Oh, uh, yeah. we have such a parasocial relationship with this party and these two people specifically. Uh, but it's cute. It's fun. It's the, it's the blurbers from my show. It's the blurbers from my show. And the people who play them, who are also kind of my blurbers, too. Yeah. Did I use that right? Yes, you did. Okay. So, yeah, that's it. That was the first part of the Happy Fun Time party trial of the take, which is totally not the hazing ritual for a cult. Yeah, and I gotta say, pretty good Happy Fun Times. Yeah. I had a nice time. I liked this episode. Me too. Me too. That's why we are keeping this as two episodes and combining the two we don't like. Yeah, because this, this, these ones are actually fun to go over. And, like, enough happens and, like, enough to to talk about happens in these episodes that we can't actually divide them into two. Whereas, like, the next one, if we, um, like, the next party, if we only talk, if we talked about it for two episodes, it would just be the things that annoy us. It would only be groaning. Yep. 
and occasional vax vax vaxlith vaxlith vaxlith. Yep. Vaxlith. Thank you. Vaxlith. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I think this one was a really fun little example. There were some uncomfortable things, but in general, it's just kind of a delight. Mm-hmm. Shall we rate it? We shall. We shall. So, our, our delightful. Oh, fun fact. Yes. Fun fact about, uh, fun fact about our scale. Uh huh. The pizzazz point, you know where I took that from? Where? Very early day uh, Glee episode reviews. Oh my god. <laughs> Did they like, get points for pizzazz? Yeah, there was like a, a site that had funny Glee reviews. They got funnier when Glee got worse. But in the early days, they just ra- they rated the uh, musical numbers by pizzazz. And that's where I learned the word. <laughs> it's a great word. It, it definitely d- encapsulates a lot of things like visual medium and also just like shock value and like... Yeah. Things being stylish. It's nice. It it gets Yep. It gets across all the different thing. things. It does a thing for us. So pizzazz! Pizzazz! Episode. We have a trinket you didn't see. We have a neon sign on the wall. We have a new backsplash for Matt. I really like Laura's outfit and and um and Felicia's necklace and Tellison's Mohawk. Yeah. I really like Mary Elizabeth McGlynn. It's not really a pizzazz thing. I just like her. <laughs> yeah, no, I like her too. She's um, great. She's a great addition. She's got so much style. And so much, like, she just comes yes. across with, like, this immense, like, charisma that's just so contagious. That's for a later section of this. But mm-hmm. yeah, I, I kind of want to give this, like, 2.5 pizzazz points. Yeah, I think, uh, uh, yeah. Okay, I was leaning more towards 2, but I'm willing to go for 2.5. That's fine, I'm fine with 2. There were audio issues in the beginning that made it really hard to hear. And I think they the were end. like recalibrating. Yeah, I think they were recalibrating because Matt also looks like he's further away from everyone now. Yeah, and there were a couple moments where like Laura was very quiet, very oddly. I think she may have like moved a little bit too far from the mic. But, um. Mia, yeah. wonder what that's like. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, two. I think two Two seems two. fair, right? Two is good, yes. Okay, and the second letter in the Provence scale is U for uncomfortableness. There was yeah. some stuff. Not huge yeah, we stuff. We are kind of two, like, yeah, the the entire older situation and the way of Felicia is playing it, which is very much in this anime and um, sexual harassment is funny when it's women on men kind of style makes me uncomfortable. Yeah, but I'm also... Like, I'm also uncomfortable with, like, Lyra on two fronts. Number one is, like, I'm uncomfortable with the ways that, it, like, it does, like, the sexual harassment is fine when it's on women against men. And I'm also uncomfortable on the other side of, like, the ways that she is made fun of, in a way. Like, make me feel very, like, target. Like, I don't know. It yeah, I don't feels know. really, really infantilize her. Yeah. And also, she seems, like, very much, like, she's not, she's not, like, again, why are you booing me? I'm right. Yeah, and also feels like a little bit much like point and laugh at the uh, girl that is uh, that probably has some um, yeah. neurodivergence going on. Yeah, it, it it made me feel kind of gross sometimes. I think that's yeah. generally the thing that bothered me more so than say like the you know uh, slurs against the sex it's workers, like, which is par for the course. It's a, yeah, it's like it's a very short uh, mention mm-hmm. at some point. Yeah. Yeah, so I think she, I, I'm leaning towards like a one point five, like a negative one point five. Cool. Yeah, that's that seems fair. So it's a half a point remaining. Mm-hmm. The R is for role playing realness, and holy shit, we have arrived. Yeah, this one is great. I love the role. I yeah, love like the. Just- I, I think I've never really appreciated before just how good, like, the Vex and Zara uh, first watch was. Like, this is... I kept watching it before <laughs> and I've liked it before. But, like, this time I was, like, really, like, endeared by the whole thing. Just Zara in general. Like, Mary Elizabeth enters the scene and is fucking on. Yes. Yes. Uh, <sighs> Alice was having a really good day. The Percy stuff in this episode is great. It's great. Percy's, like, so odd that, like... Travis is kind of fun sometimes. Like, you get to see a little bit more, yeah. like, character from Grog than you normally do. Yeah. Vex is great. Yeah, also, Vex is Vex great, is great, but Vex gets her own category. She gets her own category for being great. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> 
And also, I mean, as uncomfortable as Lyra is in places, Felicia is also bringing it. Yeah, and I kind of like how, like, as uncomfortable as it is sometimes, I do kind of like the the sort of Lyra and Scanlan dynamic. Like, yeah. I like that he doesn't hate her. Yeah, I like that he indulges her, kind of. Yeah, and it doesn't seem to be, like, malicious indulgement either. It doesn't seem like she's he's trying to get that much out of her. He's not even really hitting on her yet. Yeah. Like they make they they joke about how disgusting they find each other. But like it seems yes. like Scanlan's kind of manipulating her a little bit, but like not that much. And for Scanlan that's downright endearing. He's it's he's it's pretty benevolent all around. Yeah. So like Yeah, so everyone was bringing it this episode. What do we like? I, I mean there weren't like really a any hard hitting yeah, a three, three point five. There weren't really any hard hitting, gut wrenching scenes or something, but I think this would be like a three point five. I'm leaning th- towards the three just because, like, okay. I want to leave room. Like, I can't quite remember how the role playing goes next episode. It might be better. It might be worse. I can't quite remember. Yeah. So a three that makes it a three point five total. Yeah, uh, which leads to our next one, which is uh, V. For vexiness. Which is also, <sighs> like, as soon as, some, so, as nobody's trying to overshadow her, Vex is really great. She's great in this episode. Like, she's, she's not Like, both quite... the subtleties that we pointed out about how, of course, Zara's... Pre- everything about Zara's presentation would push all of her buttons. Yeah, and it, 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 like, really... Like, nowadays, I was really trying to pay attention to it, because I think the first time that I watched it, I was, like, kind of turned off by, like, the girl-on-girl violence of it all. <laughs> Like stop, stop! Yeah. Why, why are you mean to each other? Kiss. Uh, but <laughs> but nowadays, like now yeah, I watched it with like a little bit more nuance, and I was like, oh, this isn't just like girl on girl violence. This is like very clearly. No, there's there's nuance to this and development. Yeah, there's nuance to this. Like this is very clearly Zara like pushing like the exact buttons that would hit hardest for for Vex, and like this makes sense that Vex would be kind of, you know standoffish and also like from the get-go like the the girl on girl violence of it is very fun yeah i like yeah no this is good vex also um has some team mom moments she's also the one who coaxes a story out of dagon the most but she's kind of funny doing so Mm -hmm. uh she gets to have a fun little fight scene with uh with trinket where trinket gets the killing blow and she's very happy about that yes she also gets to see Percy's butt. She does, which is great for Percy. <laughs> it's great for Percy and it's great for Vex. <laughs> yeah. So what, what do we give this? 2.5? 2.5 seems good. Yeah, okay. So we are at a uh, 6 points total. Yeah, we're really enjoying this episode if you haven't noticed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is, I mean, if we've, I've said before that, that these points mean literally nothing. Mm-hmm. So why not? A is for action, which um, also was fun. <laughs> it was fun. It was really short. It didn't take too long. I think like I was a little bit turned off by like the the kind of callous violence towards other human like humanoids. But to be honest, like that's a more of an uncomfortable thing. That's like a me thing. That's not necessarily a fault with the show. That's a fault we have to take with with kind of gay ju- guy guy gags, gags yeah, whatever. Yeah, the genre it's, with the game with everything. It's the lore, not this Lord episode's Rings, fault. Tolkien, mm-hmm. everyone just yeah, not not fault of the episode. The orcs kind of started it. Yeah, I think that like honestly, like a, uh, I don't know how we count like breaking the Geneva Conventions, but it's a fun combat. <laughs> it's breezy. It's it's the. Uh, what is the the slogan? The uh, easy breezy beautiful. Sure. Yes, that. Good iteration of No Mercy Percy and his butt. Yeah, I love that. Love No Mercy Percy. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, uh, two points. Two points. Two points seems really fair. Two points. A total. Bring it home. The last category is N for nine cents. There is a little bit of nine cents, I think, especially towards a the little... beginning. Yeah. It kind of meandered. In the beginning, it was a little unfocused. Mm-hmm. Like, but not too much, like... Um, it's not too long. Like, And I, I feel like the nonsense they get up to is kind of character informing and doesn't really detract from the episode much. No, I think part of it is definitely, like, in order to, like, establish the characters of Lyra and, and, um, and Zora, they spend kind of a little bit, a long time at the beginning just kind of meandering... Uh, yeah. which kind of stands out because they have like such a short time span to like get through so they're like why are we just talking about Aldo for so long 
But honestly, like, I would be okay with, like, a negative 0.5. That seems fair. Like, it's a little bit of, of nonsense, but it's really not that bad. Yeah, so that leaves us with a 7.5 for the entire episode, which is a really good score. Yeah, and I think it's deserved. This episode is really fun. <laughs> it is. It absolutely is. So, yeah. Yeah, that's the episode. Yeah. Are you excited for Trial of the Take Part 2? I am, even though I think it's the worst of the two. I agree. It's it's the more combat and sloggy one, uh, but it's still a fun yeah. one, I think. Um, I have a thesis for the end again, like the last time, or like this the time before. Uh-huh. Um, I think, all things considered, the teams should have gotten swapped, like the contracts should have gotten swapped. This team would have probably done better at the um, infiltration Rakshasa mission, and the other team would have done better fighting a dragon. Yeah, though I am glad that it happened this way, because like, <laughs> the sheer... I mean, yeah. Sh- I mean, I think that like legitimately the other team probably wouldn't have been able to fight the white dragon even if like they um i think they would have run out of time they would have run out of time that is true probably just out of i think they would have they could have and and if they had gotten to the white dragon they would have killed it and probably gotten into less dire straits but it's also the party that has like so much like they don't have vex who's there to to like mitigate how much money they're spending that is true they don't have czar there they also don't have vex there they also don't have Vex to mitigate, to act, not mitigate, to actually find the dragon for them. So that is actually like, Vex is kind of essential to this, that's true. But if it comes to just fighting a big thing, the party with the cleric and the druid would probably have been the better choice for the yeah, dragon. Yeah, when it comes to infiltrating like a, a party, or not really a party, but like a high, like a, you know, a, a socialite event. Uh, and, and, you know, rooting out uh, an imposter. Like, that would have been a more Percy thing to do. Yeah, like, uh, Percy and Vex as the uh, power couple doing that would have been way yeah. better. Though I don't think that Vex... I don't think Vax and Kiel did it poorly. Is that they're not as equipped No, that? no, Vax and Kiel are legitimately the highlight of the other team. Yeah, so. but they just, they're, they're not quite <laughs> as equipped for doing this. We, we see this also in, like, yeah. the, the uh, Marquette episodes. That, like, Vex and Percy are just really yeah. good at that kind of stuff. They are. So I guess it was, like, challenge mode for both teams in yeah. a way. Though I suppose everything would have been a challenge for the second team. Just from the personalities it's, on there. It's kind of like a, a danger thing where, like, I think that the fact that it was a challenge for them made it... Like, they they excelled at the fact that it was a challenge. Like, they scraped through and succeeded yeah. barely, as we'll see next episode. But the fact mm-hmm. that they succeeded barely ended but, up making them, like, bringing out these really fun character interactions. Yeah, also, to be fair, I think these characters have way more fun, unhinged road trip kind of yeah, energy. Yeah, I agree. So yeah, combat-wise, probably would have been better to swap, but just roleplay-wise, this is fine, this is great. I'm glad that it happened the way that it did, but I agree with definitely, like, just looking at these characters and being like, oh, did you get the contracts wrong? Because, like, this, this is really, like, oh, oops, oopsie-doopsie. You got the con- the wrong. You gave mm-hmm. the wrong contract to the wrong team. Yeah. Did you give them the fake contract? We were supposed to give these guys the real contract. <laughs> if the other one is even well, the other one's probably real. We'll get there when mm-hmm. we get there. Anyways, so that's, that's the, episode. the episode. Thanks to Lulafia for the art, Corn Sun for the music, the patrons for being patrons, and you all yeah, for listening. Yeah, thank you for listening. And uh, what is our opinion for this episode? Our opinion for this episode is that girl on girl hate is fine as long as, it, as you're very sexy about it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> See you next episode. Bye. See you next episode. Bye.